I am so glad you guys are here. Uh, we are going to have a great time today. Uh, we, we get to worship our risen Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We get to, uh, we, we get to sing, we get to hear his word, we get to uh, celebrate uh, God's work in baptism. We, uh, we get to do a ton of stuff today. And, and it's all about Jesus and what he's done for us. And, and it's just huge. So, um, let's see. As we get ready to kick in, first things first, um, Pudwell's wanted to say a big, huge thank you to everybody for helping out with uh, the luncheon after the funeral yesterday. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for, uh, for bringing some food, for serving the family. They really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. And so I just want to say a huge thank you to you for that. Next week, I'm super pumped. Uh, I get to interview Nathan Turner, and we get to hear a little bit more about, um, about the mission that God is calling him to in Georgia. I'm super pumped about that. That's a little bit is in your, uh, in your bulletin. Please be praying for Maria, um, Maria Stolen. We uh, interviewed her a few weeks ago. She is still waiting for her visa so that she can go to, um, to her next stage of mission uh, in Africa. And so if you would please pray for Maria. She's not the only one who's waiting for her visa. It's like her and her whole team. Something's going on. I don't get it. I don't know what's going on. We're just leaving it in God's hands. Okay? So if you guys would join me, pray for uh, Maria and her team. Uh, we've, got, we've got Thursday worship. The Thursday night worship is, is, kick, is in full swing right now. And so uh, if you know you're going to be gone on a Sunday coming up, come on out on Thursday night and join us for worship Thursday night. If you know you're not going to be gone on a, on a Sunday, come on out on Thursday night and, uh, and join us for worship. It's a little bit different, a little bit different format, um, and, uh, and, and you'll, you'll, have a, you'll have a great time. We're having a great time. Next week we're having a potluck. Um, so, hey, bring a little something to share. Let's hang out and, uh, and, and just spend, spend a little time together, and we'll, we'll have a really great time. I don't know what you want to bring. I can tell you that I, um, I was just up at camp last week and had, um, had some, I think it was chicken. It was either chicken or pork, um, and they served like this Bahama coleslaw. It was, like, it, it was like coleslaw with like pineapple in it, and, uh, and, you know, and it felt like coleslaw took like a little trip down through the islands. It was fabulous. So if anybody can find that recipe, that'd be fabulous, all right? <laughs> just, just trying to give you guys some good ideas, not trying to make you hungry. Not trying to make you hungry, just saying. Okay, and we've got day camp coming up, food shelf coming up. Uh, if you've got teens, Valley Fair is coming up for Splash and Dash Wednesday. Um, and if you, if you need somebody to talk to about that, talk to Eric. So will you stand with me? Our call to worship this morning comes from the book of Philippians. It's Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Today... We're going to be focusing on our all-sufficient God. That God will give you everything you need to do what he is calling you to do. God will give you everything you need to do what he is calling you to do. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. I don't know what's, what God is calling you to right now. But I want you to know with full assurance that God is going to provide all of your needs. He may not provide all of your wants. That's not what I'm saying. With everything you need. Everything you need. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Glory. 
through the Gospel of Mark as, uh, as Mark is following Jesus around. Uh, we get to also, and, um, and today we find ourselves in Mark chapter 6. We're going to take a huge chunk today, and, um, and we get to see just kind of a, a great big overview of what Jesus is doing with his disciples, and and my hope is that we identify a little bit with the disciples in that they're having a little trouble figuring Jesus out. And sometimes the same thing happens to us. We just have a little trouble figuring out Jesus. Um, so if you have your Bibles with you today, turn with me to Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 7, reading in Jesus' name. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. And he, he gave them authority over unclean spirits, and he charged them to take nothing for their journey except for a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they proclaimed that the people should repent. I'm sure everybody loved to hear that. Everybody loves to hear repent, right? Everybody loves to hear like, hey, you're sinning. You need to turn from your sin and towards, turn towards God. It's easy if we say sin, it's a little less easy if we start kind of naming it. If it gets personal. And so he gives them this mission to go and, 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 and he sends them out two by two and they're not allowed to bring anything extra. And, and they did, in verse 13. And they cast out many demons and, they, uh, and anointed with many, the, you know, uh, anointed with oil many who were sick and, he, and healed them. And King Herod heard all about it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. Uh, still others said that he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted you know, to put him to death. And she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. John... John is just such an interesting character. Herod, uh, King Herod, who's not really a king, but he loves the title, is a mystic. And so he would invite John to come speak, even though he hated what he said. He hated hearing, you know, the, that he needed to repent, and yet at the same time, Herod had this desire to listen to him. It was kind of crazy, but... His wife, Herodias, who was originally his brother's wife, she had no love for him at all. She just wanted him dead. So she looks for an opportunity to do that. Verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and the military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. All right, first of all, 
Now you get an idea as to how sick this dude is. He has his stepdaughter niece dancing provocatively for himself and all of his male guests. It's wrong. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, for what should I ask? And she said, <coughs> the head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he didn't want to break his word to her, and immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. Happy Mother's Day. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is who we're dealing with. This is sin left unchecked. A mystical belief that Jesus is, you know, somehow has the powers of John the Baptist or something crazy, I, you know, this isn't reincarnation. This is just false mysticism. And it's wrong. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done. If you, if you, if you, if you have your Bibles open, you can turn over to Luke chapter 2. When they come back, the Luke, is, Luke chapter 10, I mean, Luke 10 is like the parallel passage, so Luke is telling the exact same story. And when Luke tells the story, uh, he, this is what he says about what Jesus said. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So what ends up happening is after, the, after Jesus sends the disciples out and they're going out two by two and they're sharing the gospel and they're casting out demons and they're, and they're healing people and they come back and they tell Jesus all about it. And Jesus is like, yeah, it was awesome. I saw Satan fall from heaven again. That's awesome. But don't just rejoice in that. Rejoice in where you're at with God that your name is written on the, in the book of life in heaven. It's awesome. Verse 31, And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat, and they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. It's time for a retreat. It's time to get away. They're going up to camp. You know, They're going to spend a little time on the lake. You know, who doesn't love a little time on the lake during the summer in Minnesota? You know, well, apparently Jesus and the disciples, they love spending a little time at the lake too. So they're so busy with ministry. They've been doing so much. They've been traveling. They've been casting out demons. They've been healing people. Everything's going on. So much is happening. And then when they get back, the, everybody, the word is just spreading about Jesus and, and the disciples and what they're doing with the healing and the casting out demons. So people are just coming and going nonstop. They don't even have time to rest. They don't even have time to eat dinner. That's how busy they are. And so he says, hey, let's go, for, go away for a little while. Let's take a break. Who wants a vacation? Who wants a vacation? I want a vacation. You want, you want a vacation. You need a vacation. Nobody else wants a vacation? All right. I'm just going to write that down. I'll see you guys. They're ready for a break. They're ready for a vacation. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. <coughs> and when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd... 
and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. And he, he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread, 200 days wages worth of bread, and give it to them so that they can eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two, and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up into heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them, them, among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the, uh, of the fish. Uh, broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Not including, you know, back then, they, it's nothing personal, ladies. It's just how they counted crowds. They just counted the guys, okay? Women and children were, were more than likely there as well. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, he meant to pass them by, you know, pass by them, uh, but when he saw them, <clears throat> when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But he immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Here in the reading of God's word. Jesus sends out, Jesus sends out the twelve and, and gives them this, op, this awesome opportunity to go and share the gospel. And, and, it's, and it's been this progression, right? So what's been happening is, is they've been with him all along. They've been watching him do miracles all along. And now he's sending them out with his authority to go and perform miracles, to heal, to cast out demons, to do all sorts of crazy stuff. And they come back after they've been preaching repentance and healing people and casting out demons. And they're, they're super pumped, but they're also exhausted. And so they go away on retreat. They go away just to, just to take a break. And as they get to the other side, everybody, the crowds of people, beat them there. Now that, I mean, when you think about it, just stop and think about like being out on a lake in a boat, okay? No motor, just rowing. The crowds were super motivated, okay? Because they're running around the outside of the lake, the lake to beat them to the place where they're going. You would think that like going around the outside would not be faster than cutting across the lake, but hey, I don't know what's going on. Maybe they were just kind of taking their time out in the boat because they were so tired. I don't know. But the crowds beat them there, and Jesus, as soon as he sees the crowds, he has compassion on them. He loved them. Compassion is love that cares. Cares for their well-being. He looks at them and he's, they're all like sheep without a shepherd. And so he teaches them. And he talks to them. Yeah, they're tired. Yeah, they're exhausted. There's no mention of the 12, though. We got no idea what they're up to. I don't know if they're off on the side, like, pouting, like, it was supposed to be a retreat. <laughs> Stupid crowds. 
But we do get a little glimpse into their attitude a little bit later because once it's later on in the day, they just say, Jesus, send them away. That doesn't sound very compassionate. Send them home. Tell them to go home. That's what the attitude of the 12 is. Go home. But Jesus, Jesus has compassion. Jesus loves them. Jesus wants to care for them. He knows it's getting late in the day. And so he looks at the disciples and says, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. And, and to them, they say, we, we can't do that. What do, you, what, what do you want us to do? We don't have enough money for that. We don't have enough food for that. We don't have, we don't have anything. What do you have? Well, I, I don't know what we have. What do you have? So they go and they find some little boy who's got, you know, his lunch, a couple of loaves of bread and some fish. I honestly believe that the text could have read totally differently had the 12 apostles believed Jesus at that moment. I honestly believe that when Jesus told them, you give them something to eat, that they could have performed that miracle in Jesus' power if they had believed in Jesus' words. And Jesus didn't just, he wasn't testing them. He said, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. They had already experienced the power that comes through Jesus. They had seen Jesus heal people. They had seen Jesus cast out demons. Then they themselves had been sent out with God's authority, and they had healed, healed people, and they had cast out demons, and they had preached in his name. They had already seen, they had already heard from Jesus how incredibly powerful their ministry was because of Jesus' work through them. And if they had just had compassion on the people, if they had just believed Jesus and recognized who he was, that when he said, you give them something to eat, they could have done it, but they didn't. Their hearts were hardened. And so Jesus did it. Jesus spoke to the people. Jesus had compassion on the people. Jesus loved the people. Jesus taught the people. Jesus fed the people. And then apparently they're still grumpy. And so Jesus sends the disciples out to clean up afterwards. Everybody loves cleaning up after dinner, right? No. But Jesus does it specifically so that hopefully, hopefully they'll get it. Hopefully they'll get it if they clean up afterwards. And so as they clean up afterwards, they've got, they come back with 12 baskets full of leftovers. That's weird. 12 baskets for 12 guys. Huh. It's almost like God planned it that way. Like one for each of them. And here's the hard part. They still didn't get it. And that makes me feel way better. Because over and over and over again, all day long, they just didn't get it. They just didn't get who Jesus was. They just didn't get what Jesus was doing. That Jesus loved people. That Jesus had compassion. And so he sends them home early. You, back in the boat. See you later. That's when you know you're in trouble, right, guys? If you, get, if you, like gets, if you were out for dinner and you get sent home early, you're in, you're in trouble. They get sent in the boat. Jesus dismisses the crowd. And Jesus goes to pray. I am so glad that prayer is not recorded in Scripture because I am positive that was... It was some hard praying. As Jesus is talking to the Father, that must have been a hard conversation. And then later on that night, Jesus just walks across water. Yeah, the boat's kind of there, and it's, and it's, in the, it's, it's going into the wind, and they're, they're making headway painfully. And Jesus just keeps walking across the water, means to pass them by, you know, like nothing's going on. Just planning on. And when they see Jesus, they freak out. They're terrified. They're screaming, Ah, it's a ghost! I just woke everybody up that was just napping. So good. I love doing that. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm not saying anybody was napping, 
Other people do that, not you guys. Other churches. Ah, it's a ghost! They're all crazy. They're all terrified. They're all freaking out. And, and Jesus sees them, and he was planning on just walking right past them. But when Jesus sees them terrified, he loves them too. He gets in the boat. He calms the water and the wind. He calms his disciples. And here's the hard part. Verse 52. They were utterly astounded, for they didn't understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. They still didn't get it. Jesus is taking care of everything. Jesus is, Jesus is doing so much through them and for them, and he's showing them all along the way exactly who he is, that he is the Son of God, that he has the power to, to conquer sin and death, that he has the power to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to feed thousands of people, and they still don't get it. But don't be too hard on them, because you know what? There are plenty of days where I don't get it, too. There are plenty of days where you don't get it, too. We don't get who God is. We're going through this stuff in our life. We're in a boat and we're making headway painfully in our lives. I don't know what you guys are trying to row through in your life. Maybe you're tired. They were tired from ministry. Maybe you're tired. They didn't have compassion on the people. Maybe you're having trouble having compassion on some people in your life. Is there somebody in your life that you're having trouble loving? That you're struggling with compassion? That you just want to send out of your life? Go home. Jesus gives us everything we need to do what he's calling us to do. Jesus was giving the disciples everything they needed to do what he was calling them to do. He sent them out two by two. He gave them everything they needed. They didn't need, they didn't need an extra coat. They didn't need extra money. They didn't need extra bread. Jesus was giving them everything they needed to do what he was calling them to do. All they needed was the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. And they cast out demons and they healed the sick. And they preached repentance. And they did it. They did it. And they still had trouble with compassion. They still had trouble loving the needy. They still had trouble getting it because they didn't understand who God was. They didn't understand who Jesus was. Their hearts were hardened. Jesus is giving you everything you need to do what he is calling you to do. Jesus is giving you everything you need to do what he is calling you to do. To be compassionate to the, towards those that you don't want to be compassionate. To love those who you're having trouble loving. To do the ministry that, that you're having trouble doing. Jesus is giving you everything you need to do what he's calling you to do. And I love, I love that he gets into the boat even though his plans were to pass them by, he loved them too. Even when they weren't getting it, even when their hearts were hardened, even when they're terrified and screaming, he loved them too. And that's what he does for us. So today, I want, I, my, my prayer is that, that each and every person here would know that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on on the cross for your sins is giving you everything you need. He's giving you all of the forgiveness that you need for all of your sins. He's giving you all of the compassion that you need to be compassionate towards others. He's giving you all the love that you need to love others in your life. He's giving you everything you need to do what he's calling you to do. <coughs> Quick story. I may have told this before. I'm not sure. I know I've told a couple of you, so don't blow it. 
years ago. I was, uh, I was, on an, I was getting on an airplane I, um, after speaking at a conference. I had been out east. I had you know, been preaching, I don't know, I, I don't know how many messages. I think it was like 12 or 13 messages, preaching twice a day, two or three times a day, and stuff like that. I was exhausted. I was completely exhausted. And I was emotionally just spent and grumpy. I was seriously grumpy. And I was getting onto a plane, and um, I was getting onto a plane, and I, and normally I love, I, I, and actually, normally I love flying. Normally I love talking to people on an airplane and everything else. But this day, as I was exhausted and grumpy, I asked God, I prayed one of the worst prayers I've ever prayed in my entire life. I asked God, dear God, please don't sit anyone near me. I don't want to talk to anybody. Dear God, please don't sit anybody near me. And I'm being 100% honest, I prayed that prayer. It was terrible. It was a massive plane. It got onto the plane. The, board, the gate area was so empty that I thought I was at the wrong gate. I, I asked the gate, you know, the person at the gate, I said, hey, am I, on the, you know, am I in the right place? And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I had like a number two on my boarding thing, and I got on, uh, and it was one of those massive planes you know, just massive. It had like, you know, like five seats in the middle and then seats over on that side and seats over on this side. And I get in and I'm getting in like halfway down the plane and I get in and I sit down in my seat. I happen to be seated in the middle. And I looked and there was no one in my row. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I was rejoicing that no one was near me. Matter of fact, they close the door, they start with the announcements, and I looked around, I could not see another passenger. And I'm like, no wonder this ticket was so expensive. There's like five of us on this plane. I look around the entire section of the plane, completely empty, except for me. And I'm like, like seriously, how did God do that? Like, God, like I just prayed that. And he just answered that, and the plane was completely empty in my whole entire section. We take off, we're, you know, we, we get up to cruising altitude. The plane was so empty that the flight attendant came to me without the little drink cart, and she said, hey, we don't need the drink cart today. What do you want to drink? And I just pulled out a book, and I asked for, guess, a cup of coffee. She looks, at, um, she looks at me and she's like, hey, what, what are you reading? I said, I, I got this book from my mom. Uh, it's a book about a pastor who trains his dog by quoting Bible verses. Not kidding you. Crazy book. And uh, my mom knows I love dog, dog training and stuff like that. She thought it was hilarious. So she re recommends this. It's a fictional novel. And she, she, she recommends this book to me. And so she, uh, the, the flight attendant says, really? That's so funny. You know, there's some passengers in back who would love to hear about that. <laughs> really? So... She brings me my coffee, my backup. She brings me my coffee, and she brings the passengers from the back of the plane all the way up to the front, and they all start asking about the book. Tell me about this book. Well, what Bible passages does he quote to train the dog? And I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> and then they're like, well, why is he quoting scripture? That seems strange. What is this? And one of the passengers says, what does this Bible verse mean? I end up sharing the gospel with the entire plane because the steward, you know, the, the flight attendant brings every passenger. There was a passenger who left first class to come down because the flight attendant said, you have got to hear this. And I get off the plane and I'm like, Jesus, come on, man. And I felt just like one of those disciples. I had no compassion for them. I'm just doing God's work because I'm doing God's work. But God had a plan. Those people were going to get fed. Those people were going to hear the gospel whether I liked it or not. And God gets all the glory. 
and I still end up looking like a chump. That's it. God gives you everything you need to do what he's calling you to do. And when he's calling you to share the gospel, he will provide everything you need for sharing the gospel, whether you want to or not. Trust him. Don't let your hearts be hardened. Don't let your hearts be hardened. Be compassionate. Love one another. And trust Jesus that he will give you everything you need to do what he's calling you to do. Amen? Let's pray. God, you're awesome. And I'm just so excited about who you are and what you're doing. And I confess to you, Lord, that sometimes we are some grumpy participants. Sometimes our hearts are hardened. And so we ask you, Lord God, to give us compassionate hearts that loves others even when they don't deserve it that loves others even when we're tired and exhausted, that loves others even when we're grumpy and selfish. We love you, Lord Jesus. Help us to love others the way you've loved us, that you didn't pass us by, that you get in the boat and you give us peace. Help us to see that you're giving us everything we need to do what you're calling us to do. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen? Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Jesus